Thank you, Elif. And I want to thank all of you for coming, especially the Ministry of Culture and Tourism, uh, ARIT, the British Institute of Archaeology in Ankara, the American Embassy, and of course, the Aramton Museum for welcoming us here for what has already been a very interesting workshop. Today, this talk will be somewhat autobiographical, and I'm sure this is true for most of our talks. We've all become involved in archaeology and war over the last 15 years in ways that we didn't expect. We had to think creatively. We had to think in ways that had nothing to do with how we had been educated as archaeologists. And we had to work with groups different from those with whom we had worked before. And that's what I want to talk about today, my interaction with the soldiers and with creating educational programs in cultural heritage protection for soldiers in the United States during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan between 2004 and the present. And so I will pick up on some of the themes that were indicated last night by Peter Stone. I wanted to start by saying during the last 15 years, the whole nature of academic conferences in archaeology has changed. We used to talk about archaeology of diet, archaeology of gender, archaeology of agriculture, wealth, all sorts of issues of that sort. And now, if you look at some of the conferences from the last 15 years, and this started more or less at the beginning of the war in Afghanistan, uh, 17 years ago, you see conferences like archaeology of battle, archaeology of violence, archaeology of death, archaeology of destruction. The whole nature of subjects in archaeology changed from the point of view of conferences over the last 15 years. And we've seen, in particular, a stronger connection between the present and the past, between archaeology and modern conflict. Sometimes it's easier for us to understand modern conflict if we view it through the lens of ancient conflict, especially the Trojan War. And so to help people understand what went on in Vietnam and Iraq and Afghanistan, what some authors have done is to present those wars through the lens, through the perspective of ancient wars. So you see books like Achilles, in Vietnam or Ajax in, sorry, Ajax in Iraq or uh, Odysseus in America. So a connection between Trojan fighters and modern soldiers. And we see this in a number of ways. This is one of them, something called theater of war that is relatively recent in the United States where veterans, army veterans, read from the ancient Greek plays about the Trojan War, mainly plays of Sophocles. And they discuss the trauma that the Trojan soldiers experienced and that the Greek soldiers experienced during the Trojan War. And then they talk about their own experiences in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. How are they similar? How is a modern soldier like a Trojan warrior? And these are called theater of war programs, and they're intended to collapse the distance between the ancient world and the modern world. And I've become involved in this as well, as I'll indicate a little later in the talk. Now, we all know about the devastation that occurred in the Iraq war, especially in 2003, when the Iraq Museum uh, was looted. You see Donnie George, uh, the former director of the museum in the upper right slide, who was mourning the loss of his antiquities, his collection, after the sacking of the museum. And you're seeing here one of many archaeological sites in Iraq that was extensively looted in the course of the early 2000s, early on in the war. This is the site of Zabalam. Uh, it's often shown all of these are looter pits. You can see these all over southern Iraq, northern Iraq, as well as Afghanistan, and now, of course, in Syria. And when all of this was happening, I thought, who are these robbers? And why are people buying the antiquities that are looted from these sites? 
Hollywood has not helped us in the last 40 years because they have made antiquities thieves into, into romantic characters. And so, depending upon your age, when you think of an antiquities thief, you think of Cary Grant in To Catch a Thief, or Harrison Ford in Raiders of the Lost Ark, or Angelina Jolie in Tomb Raider. This romanticizes the destruction of archaeological sites, and so people don't realize that they're destroying history when they buy these antiquities. This is something that we have to fight against. And of course, it was especially bad early in the Iraq War because so many of these antiquities were appearing on eBay and were being bought by people all over the world. I pulled this from eBay in 2004, but there were many cylinder seals that appeared on eBay, and the same was true for inscriptions. And so the question was, how do we fight this? What programs do we develop? Now this came to me in 2003. After the destruction of the Iraq Museum, I was president-elect of the Archaeological Institute of America. And so we needed a war desk for the first time since World War II. We needed to find a way to make this situation better and protect antiquities in Iraq and Afghanistan. It was the first time that these requests were brought to me and I had to find a way to better the situation. The only thing I could think of doing was to bring antiquities officials from Iraq and Afghanistan to the United States and to ask them how we could help because I didn't know how we could make a difference. What do we know how to do as archaeologists? We know how to teach, we know how to dig. That's it. That's all we can do. So how can we make this situation better? So at the conference in 2004, it was Abdul Wasi Firuzi, the director of the Afghanistan Antiquity Service, who said to me, the soldiers have no idea what they're protecting. And the soldiers are now protecting the archaeological sites and the museums and the libraries. <clears throat> and so you need to find a way to educate them in cultural heritage protection and in the history of our areas, Afghanistan, Iraq, the entire Near East and Middle East. They were getting no training in this. And then I looked at the kind of training that the American Department of Defense was giving to the soldiers. Nothing connected to culture. Nothing connected to cultural heritage protection. And I realized that what we needed to do was to start a lecture program where archaeologists would go to military bases throughout the United States, and if they would let us to Iraq and Afghanistan, and give training to the soldiers about cultural heritage protection. Now, first I had to figure out how to do this, and it wasn't easy because there wasn't any connection between American archaeologists and the American military. Once, there was a connection. In World War II, there were the monuments men and women who were charged by the American military with protecting cultural heritage. So in 1945, American archaeologists and the American military had a strong connection. They worked well together on the protection of cultural heritage. And then, in the late 60s, came the Vietnam War. And then, archaeologists marched in the streets against the military, and the military began to distrust academics, and academics began to distrust the military and the anger on both sides rose. And so there was no connection any longer between archaeology and the military. So when I decided to start this program, I realized it wasn't going to be easy. And it took me a long time to do it. It took, you know, in retrospect, it was only nine months. But at the time, nine months seemed like a very long time. The first thing I did was to write a letter to Donald Rumsfeld the Secretary of Defense and asked for his help. 
And he never, of course, answered that letter. Uh, and then I reached out to a few friends that I had on a high level in the military, and they helped me get the program approved by the Department of Defense. So it was approved in 2004, and I began going to military bases with other archaeologists. We developed uh, training programs for them. We started with the Army in Fort Bliss uh, in Texas, and then the Marines with Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, and then the Air Force in New Jersey, and eventually they allowed us to go to Iraq and Afghanistan and give the training to soldiers who were stationed there. So you see me obviously here in Baghdad with Lori Rush, uh, to whom I'll refer a little later, and Diane Seabrandt, the cultural heritage liaison at the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. It wasn't easy at the beginning when we started these programs because they only gave me 20 minutes. 20 minutes to describe the history and archaeology of Iraq, the history and archaeology of Afghanistan, and an overview of all of historic preservation and what to do regarding conservation in the field. Nevertheless, we did it. And over time, they gave us more time, so we were able to give proper training to the soldiers. What I realized is that they had no idea of context. They kept saying to me, what is context? Why is context important? <clears throat> and I realized the soldiers had never studied archaeology, and so we had to start at the beginning. What is a trench? What do we do with excavations that the looters do not do? We excavate everything that we find and study it all and publish it and reconstruct history as a consequence. The animal bones, the human bones, the carbonized seeds. If we find these, history is built. If the looters find them first, history is destroyed. And this was something the soldiers could appreciate, they could understand. Many of them only knew Iraq from what they read in the Old Testament in the Bible. But nevertheless, that was something that we could work with. Many of them only knew Afghanistan because of Alexander the Great. But that, too, was something we could work with. I needed to tell them something about conservation. And we spent a lot of our time on conservation. Most of them were stationed in southern Iraq or Afghanistan where the monumental architecture is mud brick. So they needed to know what to do and what not to do. Some of them were going into museums that had just been hit by rockets. You see here the Kabul Archaeological Museum, which also had been hit by a rocket. So we needed to tell them, if they're the first people to go into a museum that's been hit by a rocket, what do they do? What's the first thing they do? What if the pipes have broken? and water is moving through the museum. What do they do? The shelves have collapsed. There's pots that are falling on the floor. What do they do? With whom do they speak? What don't they do? What kind of documentation is necessary? We had to make them into conservators in the course of the day, because that was all the time we had. We also had to get them to stop the looting at archaeological sites. And so this was something that I emphasized strongly in my lectures, the problems of looting, the destruction of history. And Lori Rush, my colleague, uh, who is also an archaeologist, developed these playing cards, which every soldier receives who goes into the field. And every card has a lesson that we want them to carry with them into the field. So purchasing ancient souvenirs in antiquities helps fund the people who are trying to kill you. Do not buy antiquities. Or I wanted some of them to understand how the residents of Iraq and Afghanistan feel when their historical monuments are destroyed. And so Lori created this card. How would we feel if someone destroyed the torch of the Statue of Liberty? This is something they could understand. When soldiers go in the field, often there is no power but they can always play cards. So if they're playing cards, why not learn about cultural heritage protection as they are playing? And so we tried to work these cards together with 
the cultural heritage training programs that we had developed. And I realized we shouldn't just do it at the military bases, we should bring the soldiers into our museums and train them there. And so with the Air Force Base at Fort Dix, I bring soldiers to the Penn Museum and I use our own collections to train them in cultural heritage protection and in techniques of conservation. This has worked very well for us. What I've also done is to create a program that is similar to theater of war. I hadn't realized anything about combat trauma for the soldiers, what we call post-traumatic stress, PTS, where they're almost unable to function following their service in war. Now, many of the Homeric heroes were also unable to function after their service in the Trojan War. And so we talk about these things together. Veterans, past and present, Homeric soldiers, modern soldiers. And what I found is that when we do this, the soldiers view it as part of the healing process. They understand it's not just them. People have been experiencing this trauma for 3,000 years. And so they're not alone. They're part of a long cycle of history. And that helps them get better, or at least learn how better to deal with the world. And so we use museums, our own museum, as part of the healing process. And this is something we've all learned to do in the last 15 years. The objects in our museums have to tell different stories than they once told in order to fit a new world. Sometimes it's difficult to tell them what to save, what to preserve. We tend to think that cultural heritage protection is easy. Knowing what to do is easy. It's not easy in every case. If we're in, or if, if we had been in Tirana in Albania, would we want to stop the destruction of the statues of Enver Hoxha? or the des destruction of the uh, Lenin and Stalin statues in Berlin, or the destruction of the colossal images of Ferdinand Marcos in the Philippines. Is this cultural heritage? It is for me. Is there any excuse for destruction of cultural heritage? There isn't, for me. I only speak for myself. This is part of history. There is no excuse for me for the destruction of history. If these objects create prejudice or racism or injustice, take them down, put them in a museum, and put up panels next to them that explain how these images were used to create hatred. But destruction, for me, is untenable. I ran into this in southern Iraq when we were in Ur looking at the House of Abraham this is a building that Saddam Hussein built in 1999. He built it because he hoped the Pope would come to Iraq to see it. But it's built from scratch. It's built from nothing. And so it's a creation of Saddam Hussein's. It has nothing to do with the history of war, except I would argue that it now does have something to do with the history of war. It's part of the history of the site that the site has been used for political propaganda. And so when I was in Ur with Diane Seabrandt in 2009, and I was speaking to Abdul Amir Hamdani, who some of you know, who at that point was the supervisor of this area, and he said, we will now destroy this. And I said, don't destroy it. It's part of the history of the site. The site was used for modern politics. So put up a sign that indicates how it was used for modern political propaganda, but don't destroy it. And you can see the photographer took a photograph as I was making this appeal, and you can see his response by looking at his body language, although the building continues to stand. But these are things we talk about with the soldiers. If they give us enough time, what should be preserved, and what is the value in preservation, and what are the problems associated with preservation? because there are gray areas. <clears throat> when, <clears throat> this is always hard for me, <clears throat> because it's so emotional. <clears throat> when I was in southern Afghanistan, 
This is when a minister in Florida burned the uh, Quran and videotaped it and put it on YouTube. And many people died. And I realized what we need to do <clears throat> is to reach out more to the children. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Because children aren't born knowing how to hate other cultures. They have to be taught how to do it. And so what I realized is that it's not enough just to reach out to the soldiers. We have to expand our outreach to children. We have to start before they've learned to be intolerant of other cultures and the monuments associated with those cultures. And so with that, we started new uh, educational programs for children with the Archaeological Institute of America. And fortunately, this is now something that we all do. Those of you who came to the Archaeology Symposium in Bursa uh, two weeks ago will have seen that nearly every archaeological project in Turkey now has programs for the children. And this, of course, is something that uh, the Museum of Anatolian Civilizations in Ankara is also doing. Halil Demirdelen, who is in the audience, has been one of the pioneers of this. Now, this is one of the, one of the issues that I want to leave you with. There are children in refugee camps all over the Near East. There are many in Turkey, as all of you know. These children are not getting any kind of educational training in cultural heritage protection. Given the way things are going, many of these children will grow up here in these camps. What we need to do is to start cultural heritage training programs somehow in these refugee camps. Because where are these refugee camps located? In one of the most important archaeological areas of the world. In Jordan, in Syria, in Turkey. All over this area, there are incredibly important monuments and incredibly important archaeological sites that are at risk unless we can manage to convey the importance of cultural heritage protection to the people who are now living there. And again, I would start with the children before they've already learned to be intolerant of another culture. This is something I hope we can all work on together. This is something that we would love to work on with the Ministry of Culture and Tourism. And I think that if we work together as an international group on an issue like this, it will be stronger and more effective. And so this is something I'd like to discuss toward the end of this workshop how can we put these kinds of programs together? Because it will help to safeguard archaeological sites, and it will help to stop looting. It won't stop it, but it will help to better the situation by comparison to what we now find. Otherwise, in 10 years, even in five years, we're going to face a more serious problem in this area. I always like to end with this slide which is the entrance to the Kabul Archaeological Museum in 2001, after the Taliban were pushed out of the country. A nation stays alive when its culture stays alive. No matter who we are or what we believe, this is a concept that unites us all. So let us use this as a foundation going forward. All of you are playing a role in keeping culture alive and thus the nations associated with that culture. So thank you for that and thank you for listening to me today. Thank you. Um, one of the things that we do, we found that we couldn't reach all the soldiers that we wanted to reach with our cultural heritage programs, so we began videotaping the lectures, and these lectures were shown repeatedly on closed-circuit television at each of the bases, along with a number of other educational programs. I have no idea if this could work in Turkey. I'm not sure if on the military bases or the bases where soldiers are being trained, whether or not there would be the possibility of showing these lectures or maybe even putting them on the internet and because this is something that everyone in the public would benefit from seeing. I would also say in terms of cultural heritage protection, obviously that ties into 
the illicit trade in antiquities. With these cards, the cards can be used in various ways. If you put, if you took a deck of cards and on each card you put an antiquity that had been stolen from Turkey that you wanted to see returned, this would be a very powerful deck of cards and a very powerful form of publicity for the world in terms of cultural heritage protection and repatriation. Thank you, my name is Didier Bocasca, I'm from METU. Um, a quick answer, both, uh, uh, Zeynep, sorry, to your, to your answer and then uh, on, on um, uh, Brian's uh, intervention about talking to the military. Um, just to let you know that we are actually, actually uh, very actively talking to the Turkish military and the diocese of the Partnership for Peace. Um, yesterday, um, uh, Peter Stone mentioned uh, the Blue Shield and then we are currently um, deciphering training with the Turkish military on um, um, training middle ranking officers in the Turkish military on the illicit trafficking, the awareness of cultural heritage, um, both on this side of the border um, where, 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 where they are um, active and when they are, where they are getting training, but also prior to them going onto theatre. So, so maybe we need to talk um, a bit more for you to be uh, to be aware under uh, uh, that um, scheme that is actively uh, being put put in place.